Good morning. I'm David Weston. On behalf of Bloomberg, welcome to Bloomberg Invest Talks. We have a terrific lineup of speakers for us all today. And we want to thank, at the very outset, BMO, because they are making this all possible. I'll be frank with you. I am relatively new to these virtual meetings. Some of you may be new as well. So there may be technical problems along the way. I hope there aren't. But in case there are, I hope you'll be patient. At the same time, I'm told that if you have trouble with the audio or the video, it helps sometimes to refresh your browser. We want to make this as interactive as we possibly can. So if you have questions that you'd like posed to the speakers, you'll see like a little box down in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Type it in there. We'd like you to insert your first name and your city. It's, they'll be sent along to us and then the moderators will do our best to insert those into the discussion. We also, with some people, will be posting some poll questions. You'll have a screen that comes up at the bottom that will ask you a poll question. We'd love it if you take just a moment to insert your answer and then click submit. And finally, social media is all the rage these days. And so if you tweet, and we hope you do, we'd like you to use the hashtag Bloomberg Invest. And with that, it's time now to welcome our first and very special guest. He is the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission. He's the Honorable Jay Clayton. So Jay, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. It's 2020, we're not even halfway through. It has already been an extraordinary year. We have a global pandemic. We have global recession, economic crisis, and now we have civil unrest across the country. How are those crises affecting the markets you regulate and the Securities Exchange Commission itself? Well, David, um, look, I th thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for mentioning that um, some of us may be less technically adept than others because I'm, I'm one of those. Uh, but most of all, thank you for raising uh, the important issue of, of what we're seeing today on television and, and the like. And, let me say, I look at this from from two perspectives. One of it, those is is being the uh, person who has to lead a, a 4,500, 5,000 person organization in a time like this, when I know um, a number of my colleagues are hurting, um, and we're all hurting, but in different ways, in ways that we we can't understand um, when they see images like we've seen, um, and and you know we we at the commission are committed to an inclusive um, and, and, and diverse um, uh, operating environment and supportive environment. And I think a lot of people who um, uh, have positions like mine in organizations are focused on that today, making sure that um, our people feel supported um, and uh, that it's not just a commitment today, but whatever we've done in the past, um, whatever we're doing today, we know we need to do more in the future. I think that's that's how I'm looking at it from uh, um, an operational and personnel standpoint. Uh, and, and of course, we have a of an issue of safety and, and, and well-being. At the same time, there are markets as well. What are we seeing in the markets? Yeah, we have a job, David. We have a job to continue to, to continue to oversee the markets, make sure that they're functioning fairly um, and transparently. And, and, and look, I never try to be a market prognosticator. That's not my job. My job is to be the referee, to be fair. Um, but what you're seeing in the markets today is you're seeing the markets look down the road as they always do. The markets reflect today's assessment of where we're going to be tomorrow. Um, and I think the markets are looking down the road. They're, they continue to anticipate a recovery. Um, and and that's, what, that's what we're seeing in the marketplace today. And that's why maybe the markets are not moving, as you might expect, if they were looking at more current events. If you look back over the last uh, two or three months now, we've had a lot of market movement, a lot of volatility, precipitous drop in the stock index, come back a fair amount as well. Have the markets performed the way you would hope they would perform? Well, uh, uh, yes. The answer to that is yes. Let me qualify that by saying performance being functioning. Now, yeah. again, I don't, I don't, I don't pick prices. I don't want to do that. Our job is to make sure that they're they're fair, efficient, that they're transparent, that people can make the judgments um, that make our markets work. And I've been very pleased uh, from that kind of operational perspective. And I'd be re remiss not to mention that the actions of the Federal Reserve, uh, the Treasury, in conjunction with with Congress and the administration, to provide certainty, to provide liquidity. Um, through the most challenging period so far, um, truly remarkable. Uh, if they haven't acted as quickly and as decisively as they had, um, you know, I don't know that I'd be able to say that function has performed uh, as I'd like. So um, a, a real hat tip to uh, just a, across the government response uh, to the uncertainty created by the pandemic. 
Jay, if we go back to the very founding of your organization, 1933, 1934, it was founded on disclosure to investors, so investors could make informed decisions. Uh, the things that we need to know today to invest may be different than they were just even a year ago, uh, given this pandemic, uh, issues of business continuity, of the way we treat our employees. Does that change your attitude at the SEC about what needs to disclose, be disclosed, the level of it? How's the disclosure been on those sorts of issues? David, you hit the nail on the head. It doesn't change the fundamental principles of our disclosure-based regime, which is companies should communicate with their investors the information that is material to make an investment decision. Now, what that is, depending on the environment and how it, and how it changes, may be different. And that's exactly what we've seen in the last earnings season. We're not seeing companies disclose, okay, here's where I was in January from an earnings per share point of view. Here are the few things that changed, and this is why you can expect a few cents more, a few cents less going forward. We're seeing disclosure around, okay, here's what happened to my operations. Um, you know, I'm able to operate in these areas like I used to. These areas are severely constrained. Here's what that means for my revenue. Here's what that means for my liquidity position. Here's how I've borrowed more money or raised more money in other ways. That kind of information is what investors are looking for. And, and you, you hit a, a very important one, which is, Operationally, when, when we have to be concerned about uh, the health and safety of our employees, the health and safety of our customers, the health and safety of those around us, um, how, how does that affect our operations? And what more information, what more information do companies need about health and safety to better operate, to better serve their employees, to better serve their customers? All of that is new, but it does fit within our fundamental principles-based disclosure regime that I'm so thankful we have. Talk about specific issues in relation to enforcement having to do with COVID-19, because there have been various reports of companies making claims that perhaps are unsubstantially and maybe misleading investors. Also, some reports that perhaps some public companies were not entirely truthful in applying for some of those PPP loans. What's the SEC status in enforcement of those sorts of issues? Uh, David, we have um, on the let me put it this way, on the, uh, on the claims that look, look suspect or are clearly speculative or, or just on their face fraudulent, um, our enforcement team is out there. They're shutting down trading in companies that would do that. Um, be, and we need to be. Uh, people are counting on us to look at those kind of claims, uh, quickly, quickly assess whether they have any validity, and then where appropriate, shut down trading so we can find out if, uh, if, if tales of riches to come are in fact true. That's our job. I, I can't thank the women and men of the enforcement division enough for being vigilant in this area. I, I think the number of trading suspensions is into the 20s. Um, I, recently had a, um, I recently had a call with my international colleagues and I, uh, my international colleagues uh, gave our enforcement division the gold star for quick action. Um, in identifying these types of scams and shutting them down. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really uh, uh, kind of a frontline immediate job we have. In terms of disclosure um, and, and loans and that, like, look, what I've said to companies is be consistent across your community. If you're communicating with the marketplace, um, that communication ought to be consistent with whatever you're telling the government about your need for support. Uh, and by and large, I think companies are doing that, but it's, it's important for good corporate hygiene trust that if you're telling the government you need money, you're telling your investors you need money. Uh, what about some of the initiatives you, you were working on before the pandemic came up? Talk about like revi revisions to proxy rules. Do those continue apace or do you have to put those to one side? No, we, we have not put our policy making agenda to the side. Um, we are we are a very when you talk about organizations um, being affected in different ways by uh, the operational constraints of social distancing and um, uh, the health and safety uh, structures that we live by. We're a very lucky organization. We're, we're we can operate fairly effectively um, in a remote uh, capacity, and we've been doing so. Uh, and look, the, the, the women and men in those policy making divisions, uh, they're committed to improving our markets and modernizing our markets. I'm not going to put that on hold unless I have to. And so, for example, the proxy rules, where do they stand now? 
Uh, we're, we're in. They're on our. They're on our agenda to be finished in this fiscal year, and I expect to uh, have them finished in this fiscal year. I, 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 I'm so pleased with the rigor that our staff has applied uh, to all the comments we've received, and I think we're on schedule to finish them uh, during this fiscal year. Um, what That's about September? People don't know about the SEC fiscal year, so by 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 the end of this uh, by the end of this period. And how do you feel about bringing people back to work at the SEC? I think you've said at least until July 15. Uh, do you think that that's realistic? Well, David, I, I do think it is um, it is realistic because we are able to function. I mean, every organization is different. And I'm not making choices for other organizations, but this organization functions very well in a virtual environment. Uh, there are a number of functions that we have that would improve um, with people on site. There are some functions where you do need um, people outside. Look, we live in a we live in a, a country where due process is important, and we have people who um, uh, we're bringing actions against. And if they want the the benefit of being interviewed face to face or being uh, able to in as virtual a face to face environment as possible, we need to provide that to them. We're, we're you know we believe in due process, so those types of things um, we have to do. But by and large, we can operate very effectively remotely. And what I want to do is, as as things get back to normal, and I hope they do, I hope they do, bring bring people back in those areas that are most acutely affected by remote working, and then go from there. Um, keeping health and safety you know, front of mind at all times. So. Uh, I have the luxury of that, given the way we work. I know others others don't, um, but that's how I'm looking at it here. Uh, Jay, let's turn to another subject that's very much in the news these days, and that is China. And you have been uh, outspoken on one aspect of this, which is certain risks that American investors have investing in Chinese publicly traded companies. Uh, my question is, do you have the tools you need to protect American investors from those risks? So, David, let's let's just articulate those risks fairly clearly, and then and then go to your second question. Uh, the the principal difference between Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges and other foreign companies listed on U.S. exchanges is the ability of the PCOB to inspect audit work papers um, of those companies. For my money, Sarbanes Oxley had a lot. But the two things Sarbanes-Oxley had that were the most benefit for investors were the requirement to have an independent audit committee that was intimately involved with the preparation of the financial statements, the financial presentation of the company, um, and PCAOB inspections of audits. I mean, the bedrock of our system is good financial information. Um, and this, this asymmetry, you can call it an unlevel playing field with Chinese listed companies versus other companies um, from non-US jurisdictions listed uh, has gone on for too long. And first step, let's make sure investors understand it. Second step, and the administration is now looking at this, uh, Senator Kennedy and Van Hollen have a bill that has a, a very sensible approach to this, which is give people time to, to level that asymmetric uh, or unlevel playing field. Uh, now we know about it. Now we got to figure out what we're going to do about it. Well, is disclosure enough in this situation as a practical matter? I mean, there, there are now proposals up on the Hill, as you know, the Senate has passed. It would say if a company, I think if the rule is if you don't allow access to the audit papers for three consecutive years, you get delisted. Do you need that kind of power? Well, first step, disclosure. But I, but I do think that we need to consider whether more to level the playing field. And, and I, I think the, the bill you mentioned, the, the Kennedy Van Hollen bill, it's a very sensible way to look at this if you're going to do more because it gives people a period of time uh, to level the playing field before you would take any action. Uh, you know, I'm not a guy who wants to take like precipitous, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head with the hammer tomorrow. But, you know, I, I like the way they've approached it in that there's a period of time to come into compliance. And if you don't, then it's time to um, take, take, measures beyond just disclosure. Jay, from you having watched this over some period of time, 
uh, and I know you don't want to name any individual companies, so I won't name any individual companies. But is it across the board with Chinese publicly traded companies, or is it more a problem with some of the smaller or maybe up and coming ones as opposed to some of the really big mega cap companies that we all know the names of that have been publicly traded for a while? Well, well, David, you you, you bring up a good question, uh, but a point that applies in every market. Uh, financial controls, audit procedures, and the like, they're different for larger companies than they are for smaller companies. And uh, there are a lot of smaller companies uh, from th that have operations in China that are listed on our markets. And investors might look at those differently from the multi-caps or, or from state-owned enterprises. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on international investing, but I, but I do know enough to know that you shouldn't look at a particular jurisdiction in a monolithic way. Uh, you should you should look at that um, as to whether you're looking at a smaller company, uh, a, a, an international company that derives a lot of its revenues from outside of that jurisdiction, or a state-owned enterprises which has its own risks and reward profiles. Jay, um, do you talk with your counterparts who are security regulators in Beijing in China? I mean, there have been times when the Chinese government has said, "We really want to try to coordinate. We want to harmonize. We want to open up our markets." Our securities markets. Is there any prospect of actually some of that harmonization coming about? Uh, look, we do talk. Um, I talk to my my counterparts around the world. Um, there's nothing that I have uh, said to you that I that I haven't said to them, and that this is a problem that uh, I believe needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, I hope it can be. Are you hopeful? Do you think it will my be? I'm, look, I'm an optimistic guy, but I'm but I'm optimistic because I, I know that at some point, uh, you know, hope is not a strategy. You got you got to do other things as well. So you said the legislation is pending; it's been passed in the Senate. Uh, it sends a, I think you said sensible way of approaching it. Is it doable? Is it something that, as you look at it, the SEC could enforce without too much difficulty? Oh 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 yes. No, it's a it's a it's a sensible piece of legislation, and it and it uh, captures the issue in a way. Look, I. I, I try very hard not to, uh, to to tell Congress what to do. It's the other way around. They tell me what to do. Um, but this is a this is a very sensible way to approach a, a problem that's been around for a while. Jim, let's turn to another subject that you have talked about, and that is supposed ESG, environmental social governance issues. And, and there's a lot of people saying we should have a different method of disclosure ESG. Certainly, investors seem to be taking that into account as they're making investments. If we watch some of the indices. Uh, give us your thoughts on what the SEC can, should, or should not do to really facilitate investors understanding the E, S, and the G. Uh, well, David, it, it does, in each of those cases, let me say two things. In each of those cases, it goes back to materiality. What What is important to a capital allocation, to an investment decision, uh, whether it's governance? Do you, we, we talked about the PCAOB inspection and audit committees. Do you have a do you have a well functioning audit committee? I want to know that when I want to know about G when I allocate my capital to you. Um, if it's if it's in E um, and you're in a particular sector where there's going to be uh, regulation um, and the like, uh, how are you planning for that? How do you deal with current regulations? How how are you dealing with customer um, uh, preferences and, and the like? Um, so yes. What is material to an investment decision in each of those areas? But there is something that troubles me, David. You and I have talked about this, and that is lumping E, S, and G together. They're very different considerations, and it particularly troubles me when there's one overall ESG G rating. I'm going to go back to my my study of economics days. You know, Ken Arrow won the Nobel Prize for uh, a body of work, but one thing was that you know ordering preferences uh, in that way. Uh, doesn't really work. It's particularly hard when you order preferences against things that are unrelated to each other. So a single ESG score, I'm highly skeptical of whether that gives investors information that they need to make the kind of investment decision um, that they want. And, and, I, and I've, I, I've invited portfolio managers, um, and, I, and I wanna hear from people who look rigorously at these, at these issues and allocate capital accordingly as to how we can be, how we can better guide investors as to what's an effective way to look at an investment decision in this area. Well, I certainly am not one to argue with Ken Arrow, for goodness sakes, because I'm not that good. But let me focus on one specific, and that's social. Because in the midst of this pandemic and the shutdown, that has come to the forefront 
And a lot of the discussions that say, really, we want to invest in a company that is a proper citizen, treats their employees well, treats their communities well, and is really supported by that, but that is a better investment. Is there a way of measuring or comparing social across companies? I, I, let, me, let me say two things. I think in my experience, David, and I, I've been lucky enough to see a lot of really well-run companies. I haven't seen a really well-run company that did not have its employees and other constituencies front of mind. You know, how are we developing our employees so that they're, they're better, a company can be better and the like. But for each sector, that's a very different analysis. If you're, if you're in the high tech sector, um, you know, it may be around engineering and enge engineering education, and how we, we bring people on. In, in, in other sectors, uh, big box retail, your, your, your employee mix, the skills you need, um, and the skills you need to advance are, are different. So single metric across those things is, is quite difficult in terms of, you know, how are you investing in your people now? We have a pending rulemaking. I, I'm careful not to get into that, but we're trying to move this forward. We're trying to say, look, issuer, tell your investors how you do look at your people and how you look at um, raise, raising their value for your company and raising their value for themselves. If you look at balance sheets of companies today versus 30 years ago, um, you know, the, the, the value of, 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 of employees and intellectual property 30 years ago was like 10%. Now it's 30%. Investors should understand how companies are looking at cultivating that value and increasing that value. I, I fully agree with that. You look at, uh, as we call it, Wall Street, I mean, as a general umbrella. Uh, what are your thoughts about those employees returning? We talked about the SEC returning. Uh, and your situation, but as you look at that, uh, what are the risks for actually the securities markets as we bring, for example, traders back to trading floors, things like that? How do you assess that? Well, how, how do we, we assess it by talking to those entities? Um, we, we talk regularly um, and to the exchanges, the clearing houses, uh, the, the large, um, uh, what you would call traditional investment banks, the large asset managers. And one of the things that's, that's at the top of those conversations is how are you functioning in this environment? Um, are your systems strained? Do you have increased cybersecurity issues? Uh, what additional investments are you needing to make um, if we're going to be in this environment? Uh, we've had those conversations across the board at the start, uh, starting in uh, you know, mid-March. Uh, as people move to telework, we've had them on an ongoing basis and, you know, have regular tick ticklers to have those conversations. So, David, what are we finding? Uh, we're, we're darn lucky that we're not in this 10 years ago. Uh, we would not have had the technological and infrastructure backbone across the financial system to be able to work remotely um, like we can today. Um, are there areas of stress? Uh, of course there are. Uh, I think people have identified those and are investing in those. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, let me just say this, it, it's front of mind for us. I know it's front of mind for our registrants and uh, it's something that we need to pay constant attention to, particularly in the cybersecurity area. I think we, we should all recognize that it's always an issue. It's an increased issue when you have people working remotely. Do you have a sense of how uh, the system is held up to that? Because that has been a concern, certainly across all U.S. industry, working from home, but particularly in the securities industry, in the financial industry, as we have people trading from home, very, very sensitive data. Did we have the cybersecurity in place that we needed these individual companies? Uh, let me, let me, let me, I, I want to answer it this way. As I look across the system, I'm very pleased from a cybersecurity and resiliency point of view. Um, you know, like anything, as, as, the, as, the, as, the post, as, the, you know, as the post hoc analysis goes on, I expect we'll identify some issues. That's our job, we're gonna keep doing it. But, but by and large so far, I'm very satisfied. Uh, we started this discussion by saying how the crises of the pandemic, the economic crisis, and now the civil unrest has affected markets and the SEC. Has it affected, and if so, how has it affected uh, Chairman Clayton's agenda for the SEC? I mean, before this ever happened, there were certain priorities you had that you wanted to accomplish. How do those sit today? Um, 
we're we're by and large on schedule, David. Um, now my 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 commitment. Let's put us. Let's put. We talked about enforcement. We talk about inspections. Uh, I believe in those. Those are continuing apace. Um, I, it matters to me to look. If somebody's been wrong, particularly our Main Street investors, get them their money back. But let's do so in a way that it doesn't happen again. That's my agenda there. That continues to pace and um, with the uh, you know, COVID-related frauds that we're trying to stamp out now, um, being an example of that. On the on the markets and how they function, it's all been about modernization. We have a great architecture. We talked about our framework for disclosure. We talked about our framework for trading. Um, the technology moves on. Life moves on. We talk about the importance of intellectual property and um, our, our, our employee contribution to companies today being different. Modernizing our rules to reflect that. That agenda goes on. Um, we talked about proxy. That's part of it. But a proxy system was built up at a time um, when the mails, the mails were how you communicated with your shareholders. You know, we, you communicate with your shareholders in venues like this now, David, and uh, our proxy system should reflect that. But with the same principles of transparency and fairness and understanding, understanding where the power of the vote is. That's, those are fundamental to our, uh, uh, to our security system. One of the things we talked about before is your uh, concern that individual investors have access to some of the sophisticated uh, sorts of securities that the big institutional investors have access to. How does that sit? Well, continuing to work on that, it, it is a um, it, it's an interesting, vexing, but um, important problem that we have to solve. Uh, our markets have transformed uh, to a position where many opportunities are in the private markets. And our sophisticated investors uh, have the ability to tap those markets. And they do so with large investments. One of the great things about our public markets is individual investors invest side by side with our institutional investors. They get the same deal. If you invest in a public company as an individual investor, you're investing you know, on virtually the same terms in all respects as an institutional investor. Challenge for the SEC is how do we get individual investors access to those private investments where they sit side by side with sophisticated investors and a pool of sophisticated investors. Great thing about public markets is you're not sitting just side by side with one sophisticated investor. It's a whole pool of them. How do we get people access to those private markets? They're sitting side by side with a pool of sophisticated investors and at a cost that makes sense, not a high entry fee or a high exit fee. That's what we're working on. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you said that you 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 uh, take your orders from your, the Congress. You don't give orders to. If you there was one thing that Congress said, I'll give you some power you don't have now. What would it be? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm just going to say I, I'm, I'm always careful what I wish for, David. <laughs> Leave it that. Yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. And generally, that's, that's a fair point. Okay, Jay, I really appreciate your spending time with us today. It was really informative and helpful. You're terrific to be here. That is Jay Clayton, and he is the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission. And now it's my great pleasure and privilege to turn it over to my fellow anchor at Bloomberg, Scarlett Fu. David, thank you so much. Great conversation there. And welcome, everyone. I want to introduce our all-star panel for this next conversation. We have with us David Hunt, President and CEO of PGIM. We have Jenny Johnson, President and CEO of Franklin Templeton, as well as Christy Mitchum, CEO of BMO Global Asset Management. Obviously, there's a lot of ground to cover here. Um, the view from 30,000 feet when it comes to global markets, when it comes to asset management, and the challenges ahead. Now, challenge is a big word uh, of the moment, and Starting with that, I want to kick off our session with a poll question. Um, what do you see as the biggest threat to financial markets in the next six to 12 months? And the different options here are rising China-US tensions, resurgence of COVID-19 and what that brings, insufficient fiscal policy uh, in response to the pandemic, and of course, what we've been seeing in the last couple of days, social unrest. Please submit your answers through the platform. Now, as we get to our guests, uh, I want to start on that idea with our panelists as well, because there's clearly a laundry list of issues out there, of risks out there. And yet, when you look at the stock market and you look at risk assets, they are holding up just fine and in many cases rallying. People were talking about a disconnect here long before 
the escalating unrest and President Trump's latest comments about sending in troops. So to my panelists, I want to ask, how did this week's event influence domestic and foreign investors' view of the safety of U.S. assets, the appeal of U.S. markets? Jenny, let me start with you. Uh, so I, I think that um, what, what we're seeing right now, where you have this almost indiscriminate increase in the equity markets, uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect from uh, the realities of there, there are parts of the market that we are very positive on. So you've seen things like uh, online retailer go from, you know, 16 percent market share to 28 percent market share, something that people thought would take two to five years. That's probably not going to change. Uh, you see things, you know, the, the opposite side of it, what we've seen in, in kind of the T&E uh, and and, you know, some of the risks there that if there's a second wave, you're going to have. Uh, issues. We think that this is where active management is really important because uh, th some of the winners are going to continue to be winners. Uh, we're constructive on companies that have strong balance sheets who could withstand this because we don't know whether or not there's going to be a second wave here. Uh, and But I, I think more than ever, what we know right now is it is a time to be discriminating in your investment decisions on the equity markets. Christy, let me ask you the same question. Do this week's events change or alter the way that investors view U.S. markets, the safety, the perceived safety of U.S. assets? You know, I, I mean, I think I'm not sure that I think this week's events sort of alter that in particular. I would tell you in general what we find not that dissimilar to Jenny's comments is that equity markets we think are pretty much quote unquote, price to perfection. Uh, in terms of really two things, one, I think the resurgence of COVID has been greatly discounted in terms of a second wave in the marketplace. And also the prospect uh, for a successful vaccine we think is very much priced in the marketplace. So I think our view is that, again, I think kind of echoing the comments that Jenny had that this is a time to be discriminating. Um, I think it's also time to be really balanced in your investment portfolio. trouble if they are hearing uh, Christy. So let's see if uh, maybe Christy, if you could refresh your browser, um, that might do the trick. And for anyone who's watching and having a little bit of problems um, hearing everything, perhaps refresh your browser and that might do the trick. It worked for me about five minutes ago. Um, David, uh, let me get to you as well. Have you changed your macro assumptions or your investment positions in light of what's been happening this week? So uh, first of all, Scarlett, it's great to be with you and uh, greetings to my fellow panelists as well. Uh, obviously, it's been an incredible, uh, incredible week uh, to top off an incredible last couple of couple of months. I would uh, just uh, go one step further, perhaps, than, than Christy just did, uh, in the sense that we certainly believe that uh, the economy is going to come back much more slowly than the current pricing in the market would, would indicate. Certainly, it's priced to perfection, but even beyond that, if you look at the changes that are going to be required, not just in when we're allowed to open, but actually how consumer behavior is going to change to go back to spending, to traveling, to going out with friends, we think that's going to be a rather slow process. We think that employment will come back somewhat slowly. We think that uh, they'll be brought back in phases as, as, as businesses begin to get a sense of what the demand is likely to be. But it's not going to be happen uh, on a switch in, in the third quarter. And so our belief is that the current market prices are actually reflect an overly optimistic view and that actually it's a perfect time for discerning active management to help choose those companies which will benefit and also be very careful for a large number that are actually going to have some real damage for years to come. Yeah, there's a common theme here that we uh, hear a lot uh, about active management, how this is the moment. Christy, we have you back on, right? Can you hear us okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, um, I can. Let, me just, let me just return to you here um, for you to expand on your earlier answer and also to get a sense of um, how this recession is seen as different from previous recessions, right? Because it's something that we engineered. We actively shut down the economy. So to that end, how much can you rely on the previous playbooks from the past uh, in responding to the slowdown that we're seeing in the eventual recovery? Well, I think it's very fair to say that this crisis is 
unique, but I think it would be fair to say that we have been able to draw quite significantly on the playbook that was utilized, particularly uh, in the 2008 financial crisis. So if we sort of think back several months ago, what we were actually seeing In terms of a real absence of liquidity and a real freezing of credit markets that we saw back in 2008. And I think one of the things that I think we can take great confidence in is just how successfully the Fed and the Treasury work together to really un unroll um, a set of programs which have been immensely helpful in terms of both unfreezing financial markets, but also really adding um, liquidity into the system that can help fuel not just the trajectory of stress small businesses, but also um, consumer credit. Okay, we seem to be having problems with Christy's audio once again. Um, Christy, I'm sorry, would you be able to refresh your browser once again? I apologize for the technical issues. Um, but I, I, I take Christy's point, I want to keep on that. Christy, are you with us? Okay. I want, to, I want to continue on what Christy was saying and bring up the Federal Reserve here because that's certainly a big factor here and it's the backstop for the, the risk assets. And uh, Jenny, I want to come to you here because the Federal Reserve we know is doing all it can to support the capital markets. It's buying corporate debt through exchange traded funds. And we have a Bloomberg chart uh, that we'll pull up to, to really show you how that is. Uh, everyone bought into these ETFs before the Fed began buying in anticipation that it would. Demand for that debt is through the roof, which means that companies can raise cash by selling bonds, even when their businesses at the moment aren't able to generate much revenue. So that raises the possibility of zombie companies, uh, firms that can issue debt to stay alive, even though their business is not doing all that well. Jenny, do you see that as a risk to the economy? You know, look, I think it was critical. And, and one of the things we have to remember in this versus 2008 is this was the fastest peak to trough in a market drop. Uh, you saw that, you know, there was, there was a day that the treasury market had, had frozen up. So you, it was across the board. And I think the Fed actions to step in were really needed, uh, you know, because you had to kind of kickstart and build some confidence back in the system. Having said that, uh, you know, there is a concern about indiscriminate sort of underwriting the index markets, whether and particularly in the debt side, uh, because a company that's already on the brink, if it, we don't know how long this goes on. You know, the, the, the idea that there's going to be a vaccine in, in, in six months or even 12 months that is scalable and can be produced, uh, you know, really so that people can feel comfortable uh, is probably unlikely. And so if they're if you're investing in the debt of a company that doesn't have, uh, you know, that, that is overly exposed to a segment of the market that is going to be impacted by this, say, uh, t and &E, you know, there, there's significant risk. And at the time where the Fed is stepping in and buying across the board, such that those companies are given a longer lifeline uh, and, and you feel you know, you, you almost uh, get a sense of, of, of uh, I don't know, you become sleepy about picking what you're, where, where you want to make your bets, uh, I think can be a real dangerous thing right now. David, what do you think? I, I think Jenny really hit the, the nail on the head. I mean, just right now, investing uh, in, a, in a passive market-weighted way in fixed income, I think is a, a real road to uh, difficulties going forward. I think you now want to be uh, investing your money with an active manager that has a you know, real analysis after every single company and security that they invest in. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to separate out those companies that simply got some money because the Fed supported this, but actually don't have a business model that's going to last from many other companies that are actually going to do quite well through this. But that, all, that, is, a, that is a company by company decision, not a market call. Christy, will zombie companies put a break on the economy's recovery? So uh, I'm just going back in, so I may have missed some of the context from my other panelists, but I would say no. I mean, I think that's a, around the edges. I think certainly there are companies that would benefit from the indiscriminate provision of credit, but I think it's relatively few. Um, and I think I caught the end of David's comments, which I think would very much echo mine, which is, again, this is a, this is a time for investors 
to be making active choices, to understand the fundamentals of the companies they're investing in, their forward business model and credit worthiness, and, and make those active decisions on behalf, on behalf of clients. Okay, so let's let's turn to active versus passive because certainly active is having a moment right now. Um, passive funds have been seeing outflows, and we have a chart that highlights that divergence of late. And it's certainly a pushback against what we've seen earlier uh, in 2019, for instance. Quants are also stumbling as well because they had no data set for the pandemic and the sudden shutdown of the economy. So really, active was in the best position here to capitalize on what was going on and and to be nimble and respond. Do you think Active will be able to sustain this, uh, Jenny? I, listen, I think that in the in choppy markets, volatile markets, that is where Active does very, very well. Everybody's a brilliant investor in a full-on bull momentum market. Uh, what, what differentiates real investment capability is being able to discern in difficult markets who the winners are, and and so I think that we've had a you know a decade of tremendous amount of uh, Fed intervention, pushing a bunch of money into the system with low interest rates, such that if you're going to get returns, you went into the equity market that buoys the equity market indiscriminately. Uh, but when you have this kind of difficulty, that's when again knowing which companies can withstand the the what what could potentially be you know, an 18 month COVID issue uh, or, or longer, uh, you know, the U.S. is going to is, is likely to have a 20 percent unemployment, 40 million people out of work with a GDP that is 70 percent or 68 percent the consumer. So which companies can sustain that? It's going to be really important that there is active thinking and active management going into making those selections. Won't algo-driven quants eventually prevail and they'll be able to catch up once they have enough data to compile a history and, and figure out how to uh, capitalize on the opportunities? Uh, so uh, uh, what I would say, I'm a big believer in data and data being predictive. Data is predictive until there is some event that changes such that that prediction no longer works. So hmm. quant is, I, I think, is, is excellent as um, I believe in a hybrid of active managers reviewing uh, data driven information. But you have to be able to overlay. Take this this virus. Can you really build a prediction and a model to predict a pandemic and know how that how that's going to play out in the future? You know, those types of things uh, require somebody to look at and say, hey, it's changed. I need to overlay that kind of judgment to the data. OK, let's get a sense of your views on the overall state of the asset management industry, because the most overused phrase right now is the new normal. I hear it applied to everything. I like to call it the bizarro world because up is down, left is right. Um, and there's a temptation to apply that lens to everything that we see, including the asset management industry. Uh, David, let me start with you here. What do you think people get wrong when they look at the asset management industry in this current environment? What are some of the misperceptions out there? So I think it's a great question, Scarlett. And so many times when we go through one of these fast changes, there's a, a very human tendency, I think, to extrapolate from this particular situation and assume that the new normal will uh, be fundamentally changed. And of course, uh, we know from uh, the, the GFC, we know from 9-11, that the world does change, and it will so this time. But maybe not in the ways that people think, and maybe not as dramatically as people think. Let me give you the best example. Um, I continue to hear people say, well, we'll just work from home. Uh, this has worked incredibly well. One of the great surprises of the asset management industry is with clients at home, all of us at home, our vendors at home, this has actually worked. And so there's a natural extrapolation to say, well, maybe the, this is an industry where we can, we can actually be at home. I would say that's not true. It's certainly an industry where we can have more flexibility, where more people can work in a more uh, uh, flexible environment. But culture is at the core of our talent-based business. And culture requires people to be together, both to take in new members and to extend the culture uh, more broadly. And secondly, we're, we're an environment that requires creativity. And creativity is tough over Zoom. It can happen a little bit, but you need to be in an environment with the give and take, the back and forth to really generate good ideas. So while I hear all the calls for, uh, for, for staying at home, and we will have more of that, 
um, fundamentally our culture-driven creative uh, uh, environment will need to come back. So Christy, let me come to you on this because you have some strong opinions on the, the misperceptions and misconceptions that this crisis has uh, resulted in here when it comes to the work environment at asset management firms in particular. Yeah so, yeah, so, you know, you and I had a chance to explore this a little bit, but one of the things I hear, and, and you know, I'm, I'd be interested in Jenny's thoughts as well, you know, perhaps because I am, you know, a female leader of a large asset management organization, and, and I guess it perhaps plays into some of David's comments as well, but sort of the, the, the theme is that, wow, with all this new flexibility, aren't we creating a great uh, new environment for women? I would say, you know, I think the prospect is there that we could be creating something really interesting in terms of the ability to offer more flexibility, which I think actually would help the gender dynamics within the industry. But I think it would actually be a vast misstatement to say that this crisis has largely been good uh, for women. Um, I think in particular, caregivers have had uh, numerous pulls and stressors um, on their time during this crisis. Um, we find that many, particularly of our women employees, are shouldering a larger portion of the domestic tasks that can no longer obviously be offloaded onto a traditional support structure. So I think it's actually been quite challenging, again, for many of our caregivers who may be women or men, but also I think for women in particular. The other thing I think we have to be very cognizant of is that a digital environment may not be fantastic for all of the underrepresented groups in our population. Many underrepresented groups are actually very much impacted by stereo threat, stereotype threat. I think as leaders, we've learned to conduct the meeting in a way that actually adds equity to an otherwise, I think, inequitable um, sort of platform. And, and a lot of those subtle cues that we use to draw people out are not as effective on video. So certainly much of the emerging science that I'm seeing is that in fact, the digital meeting may actually amplify inequity, not work to resolve the inequities that we see in the traditional workforce. So, uh, you know, I just bring this up because I think it's gonna be really important as we think about what we carry forward from this crisis that we really focus on inclusivity and diversity um, in a way that, that I think, you know, I think there's a little gloss on it today without really kind of digging into some of the issues that are presenting themselves. Okay, and I just want to remind our audience as well that uh, you feel free to submit your questions to our panelists. We will save time at the end for those questions. And if you don't have any, I have plenty more, so not to worry. Um, Jenny, I want to turn to you because um, diversity obviously is top of mind right now. And there's a lot of anger and unrest on our streets at the moment. And Wall Street has been caught up in it as well uh, with the video of Amy Cooper, the a white employee at Franklin Templeton at the time, uh, calling police and accusing an African-American man of threatening her and her dog. Uh, Amy Cooper was initially placed on leave and then she was fired. This all happened within 24 hours. Can you give us any insight into the thinking to make this decision? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, um, I, I, I just have to commend the, our crisis management team. It was a holiday, uh, everybody got together. Uh, we needed to spend time getting the facts. Uh, sometimes videos can get manipulated, and so you have to make sure that you've reviewed all the facts. I think the facts were undisputed in this case, and uh, we were able to make a, a quick decision. Uh, you know, we are a company that uh, has employees. We have offices in 35 countries. We have clients in over 170 countries. Uh, we, we really work to have both a diverse environment, and diversity means nothing if it's not an inclusive environment. Uh, and that is critical to us. And so, um, you know, we just felt that in this case, uh, we needed to make a statement. And uh, it has been a great opportunity for us to actually reflect internally uh, and, and reach out to our business resource groups and talk to them about, you know, what else can we be doing? I mean, this country, the U.S. is in, a lot of pain right now and our African-American colleagues are in a lot of pain right now. Uh, and so making it a time to really reflect internally, uh, all of us as leaders of our asset, we can't control everything, but we can control the environment in which we operate our companies. And it starts with leaders ensuring that discrimination is not tolerated and that we create an environment that is absolutely feels inclusive for all employees. What was the response from your employees 
uh, Jenny, from your clients through the decision that you made? You know, uh, I would say the overwhelming response was was supportive, and there was a segment that felt it was uh, it was unfair. Uh, but that was a, a, a small minority segment. And, you know, we have to we have to make those decisions based on our core values. We've always said we have a zero tolerance for any kind of racism. Uh, and so we felt that it was important to, um, you know, make that decision. OK, David, I want to get you in on this conversation as well. Has uh, these incidents that we've seen, whether it was Amy Cooper uh, in New York or what we're seeing on the streets right now, has it led to any internal changes at your firm? So I think that the last week has been unbelievably painful for uh, our, our black community. Um, as, as many of you know, both Prudential and PGM is headquartered uh, in Newark, which is 85% people of color. We've been there for 145 years and we're the largest employer uh, in, in the city. And so we have deep roots uh, in, in our community and we really feel uh, deeply the pain uh, that the black community is in uh, now. And I think that uh, the last week, and I would expect this will carry on for a long time, um, I see my role and other uh, PGM leaders' role in, in three ways. First of all, it's to stand with our, our Black colleagues. They are going through an enormously difficult time, and they need to understand that we are absolutely uh, with them. And I would applaud the actions that, that Jenny took so quickly, which made that statement clearly. Secondly, uh, we need to listen. We have a wonderful Black Leadership Forum, uh, which brings together all of our uh, Black associates together regularly. I'm spending time twice with them in the next couple of days, and uh, I really want to listen and understand and make sure that they feel supported. And the last, and this is the most important, Scarlett, we all need to publicly condemn racism and prejudice in every form. Um, I think that what is fundamentally different this time is that silence cannot be an option for leaders who have uh, inclusive values. And I think that uh, you've seen a very different response from corporate America this time, and I applaud that, and I would encourage all other leaders who've not made public statements on this to do so. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I want to throw in one last question here that um, goes back to the industry and goes back to what we started with. And we've talked throughout this conversation about how in this environment, the strong tend to get stronger. You see it in the market cap of uh, the S&P 500, the mega cap tech companies doing better, and the, the companies that aren't uh, in a position to benefit from this whole pandemic uh, hurting. Let's talk about what this means for asset management firms, and I'll give you each an opportunity to answer. Um, what does the crisis mean for consolidation in asset management? Because there was already this trend before the pandemic even came in which um, the, str the strong would survive and the weak would need to be bought out. Do you think we'll see that trend accelerating uh, because of this crisis? Jenny, let me start with you. So I don't necessarily think that the crisis is accelerating it because I think that the, the crisis, uh, as we've already all discussed, is a great opportunity for active managers. So that, that part of it is, is uh, positive for asset managers. Having said that, the reality is, let's look at the trends in the industry. There's tremendous fee compression. There's a need to make investment. Uh, regulatory uh, costs have increased. Compliance costs have increased. Um, uh, there's need to make investment in technology. Data is expensive. Active managers who are able to be able to leverage broad, deep data sets to be able to gain insights from non-traditional sources of data is going to be very important. The ability to scale that over more assets is better. Um, you know, in the case we announced, obviously, our Lake Mason acquisition, uh, which, you know, was really a, a, a you know, driven by growth objectives. Uh, we think that having a, a broader product set is critical. We think that uh, having more diverse geography is going to be very, very important. Uh, and as well as it gave us uh, diversity in, in a client base going 50-50 institutional retail. And, you, you know, that enables us 
to invest more because clients are demanding more than just product management. They want additional partnership services. So financial advisors are expected to be wealth managers. They're expected to do financial planning and, and tax planning, uh, you know, things that weren't traditionally looked at by that advisor. And that's driven a lot by this fee-based uh, trend. Uh, and institutions are looking for greater insights. And so to be able, be able to, to tap into an active manager's, say, sector analyst. We have a woman who on our biotech team is a PhD from MIT in biology. She can go through all the details around uh, wh where the state is of various vaccines and uh, antivirals, which are all going to be significant if you're a macroeconomist trying to make decisions about asset allocation and un understanding that kind of fundamental. So what we're finding is clients want more from their asset managers and the ability to spread those investments across a broader asset base, uh, we think is going to be important. Christy, what's your take on this, on consolidation in the industry? So I don't know, can, I, it looks like, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, what is your take on consolidation right. in the industry? Will we see an acceleration of that? Um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I think we've obviously been on a journey as it relates to the evolution of the industry. And I think over time, it would be very safe to say that there will be fewer as opposed to more asset managers. So I think the trend towards consolidation will continue. I guess maybe taking a little bit of the con on what Jenny said, I think that some of the beta levels, um, you know, may force some acceleration of decisions um, around consolidation. Also, I think as broader businesses uh, get stressed, you know, that, that does create at, at some point decision points that may be unexpected. We certainly saw that uh, in the financial crisis of 2008. But I, I guess the other thing I think to note is if you look historically, when does M&A activity start to pick up when there, after there is a major market dislocation? It tends not to be um, for about 18 to 24 months post-crisis. So I guess I would say, yes, I think you're likely to see both a continuance and, and potentially an acceleration of activity. But my guess is that that's not what we're going to see in the here and now. And we should expect that, I think, you know, after some tail post, uh, you know, when this crisis subsides. Right. A lag there. David, your take? So I'll offer the uh, somewhat contrarian point of view. Um, I think that uh, the industrial logic that Jenny laid out is absolutely compelling, and I, I, I agree with it. The good news is that uh, asset management is not a business. It's actually a profession. And we operate uh, in the service of investors, not uh, with uh, the, only the view of shareholders in, in mind. And that's the reason why there's been so little consolidation actually over the years, despite it being, you know, predicted again and again and again that we would have these ways of consolidation. This is a talent based business and many mergers that have happened have not actually benefited clients. Um, they may have uh, helped take out costs. They may have helped expand and diversify a product line. But when you say, why is the client's investment outcomes better? Um, those have really come up wanting, and it's one of the reasons why many of the big mergers uh, over the last couple of years, you've seen the stock price has actually been, been punished for it. So I believe that it will be true that the large will get larger uh, because scale does matter more than ever, exactly as Jenny said, but it will happen slowly. And I believe that small firms that have a wonderful distinctive edge in investing will always have a place uh, in our industry. People need smaller firms with real investment edge. And the place that's in trouble is the middle that's really doesn't have the investment skill, but has gotten too big and, and too broad. And those will continue uh, to suffer and decline. But it's a much more complicated story than just there will be consolidation. All right, well said. And I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and giving us uh, their time and giving us sharing their thoughts with us. Uh, David Hunt, President and CEO of PGEN, Christy Mitchum, CEO of BMO Global Asset Management, and Jenny Johnson, President and CEO of Franklin Templeton. Thank you all for joining us today on the Bloomberg Invest Talks, Markets in Focus, this virtual event. We hope you enjoyed these conversations and we welcome your feedback. So please uh, be sure to respond to the exit survey that will appear on your screen at the end. Also, uh, a special thank you to BMO Global Asset Management for supporting today's event. Now, I'm going to go off here um, with, on, a, on a shameless plug. You want to stay tuned for more interviews in the Invest Talk series. You can follow us on various social media platforms uh, at Bloomberg Live on Twitter as well as LinkedIn for updates. 
and be sure to follow our ongoing financial markets coverage on at business as well as our website bloomberg.com and if you haven't already please consider subscribing to bloomberg.com at uh, bloomberg.com slash subscriptions thank you once again for joining us all we will see you at the next one have a great day